Welcome to the library, the home of words and people who love them. My colleague B wrote that. Um, she, she thinks it's a really powerful statement. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Jonah Albert. I am one of the events producers at the library and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you. It's a special night for us. We're celebrating two very big occasions. Uh, the first one is, of course, the 400th anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare's first folio. And the second one is a very important British library one, which is that we have just turned 50. Happy birthday to us. Thank you. <laughs> Now, we all know that the British Library is home to the folios and all the famous stuff, but did you know that right here, within our notorious stacks, I always thought stacks is a weird word for, like, shelves, but anyway, um, is the only surviving literary manuscript that features William's handwriting. The book of Sir Thomas More is a play about the life of Thomas More, clues in the title, the Tudor lawyer and polymath, Shakespeare, along with four other writers, provided handwritten edits. Which I, I thought that was a very interesting Shakespearean fact. <laughs> this evening, we are delighted to welcome Ben and David Crystal. They have gathered the finest lines from lesser-known corners of Shakespeare's plays and poems in their new book, Everyday Shakespeare, Lines for Life. This evening, you're in for a special treat as, we, as they take us into a journey um, to a journey of language, a journey of Shakespeare. Well, that's why you're all here. A special welcome to our online guests. We should have over 100 people joining us from across the country and hopefully across the world. We're glad you're able to join us. Welcome. You can also take part by submitting questions. Um, there's a question box just below the video. If you've got questions, pop your questions in there. And towards the end of the session, we will take questions from our online audience. And for those of you here in the theatre, a roving mic will come to you, um, and you can also take um, you can also ask questions. Um, also, for those of you online, you can buy copies of of the book by clicking on the bookshop tab at the top of the video, just about here. Um, and for those of you who are lucky enough to be in the Pickett Theatre here at the British Library, um, we will be having a book signing and book sales out in the foyer. I think that's enough from me, isn't it? No one came here to hear me do a bad job of introducing an event. But without further ado, we will hand our time over to Ben and David Crystal. <laughs> she upstages I, I, us every time, doesn't she, really? Yeah. The star of the show, going down. Yeah. She's been a Shakespearean actor, you know, she played Crab once in... Uh, yeah, we'll go on. Yeah, uh, you stay there. Good. Uh, uh, right, uh, what ho! Uh, peace here, grace, and good company. How many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. Dad, Dad how can you possibly tell if everyone here and uh, online are goodly? Well, I'm, I'm ima imagining, I mean, they wouldn't be here at all if they weren't goodly, would they? I mean, uh, look, you are goodly, aren't you? Yes. Oh, sorry, I couldn't. Yeah. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. Online, please. Are you goodly? Yes. Well, I could actually hear from online then. Yeah. Prove my point. Prove my point. Well, imagine, imagine, imagine you're arriving at a party. What ho! Peace here and good company. Mm. Well, that line has a lot more zing to it than evening. Hey, uh, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that you're meeting just one person. It gives me wonder, great as my content, to see you here before me. Now, you could, of course, just say, nice to see you. But... <laughs> Imagine you've been talking about someone and they suddenly show up. Your worship was the last man in our mouths. Oh, woman, of course, if you happen to be talking to a woman. Imagine... 
you're feeling confused about something. I know you don't normally, but imagine you are, all right? Mm. My thoughts are whirled like a potter's wheel. I know not where I am, nor what I do. So imagine, once again, Ben, or indeed any of you, a situation where it gets, you, you've got so out of hand, you've just no idea what to do about it. Time, thou must untangle this, not I. It is too hard a knot for me to untie. Imagine, imagine that you've secretly fallen in love with someone and you finally get to tell them with the words, I, I, I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? <laughs> oh, oh. mum's blushing in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> So is the man next to her. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, sorry, sir. Uh, but this sort of thing was our tea time table chat for years. We, rem working with Shakespeare's, we have done on, well, this is our fifth book together now, mm. and remembering lines almost by osmosis of Shakespeare. And then we would find ourselves dropping into normal... Every day. ...conversation. Mm. And the game grew, and the game grew, and the game grew. And that's what happens when you spend a couple of decades uh, you know, working with an author who has such a tremendous ability to write memorable lines like the ones we've been using. And this is where the book comes from, Everyday Shakespeare. I mean, it would happen all the time, wouldn't it, really? Yeah. Mum would, be, would look up the weather uh, online and being in the UK, often it would be raining. <laughs> so she would say, oh, rain later. So I would mutter from Macbeth, it shall be rain tonight. And then in the other room, Dad would call out the Banquo's reply. Let it come down. Yes. <laughs> and Mum would be like, get out of the house, both of you. <laughs> Uh, and we were dear. working on the book during the uncertainties of lockdown and the pandemic. Now, while uh, the following lines are from King John uh, are about a political situation, they capture well the confusion that many of us probably felt. Yeah. As I travelled hither through the land, I find the people strangely fantasied, possessed with rumours full of idle dreams, not knowing what they fear, but full of fear. I know, I don't know. Yeah. We felt that. We'd be reading through as the, the works as we'd be making this book, and every now and again, one of us would go, oh, <laughs> found a good one. Yeah. Or like a few months ago, whilst we were just punishing, putting the finishing touches to the book, my uh, back went out. Oh, yes, that's right. I remember what pops out of my mouth. You are not shaped for sportive tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Richard III, Richard III. Yeah. Sympathy from a parent? No, Shakespeare. <laughs> I'm surprised I'm still alive, actually. <laughs> and, but these are the sort of lines that we filled the book with. Yeah, lines for everyday life. Which is why we called it Everyday Shakespeare. And subtitle, Lines for Life. And as I said, it is our, our fifth book together. We started with Shakespeare's words, the glossary and language companion, and we've been working on Shakespeare together on and off for the last couple of decades, but always making books that we hope were creating bridges towards Shakespeare, making Shakespeare more accessible uh, in some way. And uh, of course this year, as Jonah said, is 2023, the 400th anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare's first folio. So it's very much a Shakespeare. Not uh, happened yet in November, really. It's November, that's mm, true. That's right. So it's very much a celebration of Shakespeare too. And, um, and uh, we must say at this point, we've got great thanks to give. Uh, both to the uh, spoken word uh, poet Lionheart, who was very instrumental in our uh, imagineering of this book, but also very much to Chambers and especially to our, our editor, Sarah Cole, who has helped us make this book. I mean, it is an absolutely beautiful uh, thing to hold and, and to see. So our thanks both to, to Lionheart and to Sarah. So what we did, you see, was uh, Ben and I, first of all, decided to read through the entire canon, all the plays and all the poems. He did it. I did it. I did it chronologically. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't. Yeah. And then we compared notes. <laughs> I'm a geek. I'm quite happy about this. <laughs> and we compared notes. And, um, you know, which ones did he like? Which ones did I like? Actually, most of the time, we found the same ones, didn't we? For we didn't disagree too many part. times. Yeah. 
We ended up with how many? We ended up with, uh, well, out of 36 plays and three long poems and the 154 sonnets, we ended up with, a, well, about 5,000 <laughs> lines that we thought this, this, you know, this is the sort of thing that we might include in the book. Yeah, and we actually, in the end, included a 1,000 of them in the book. I mean, not just the 366 for every day of the year, but lots of other associated ones that we put into our commentaries. Right, there is one for each day of the year, but then others follow on in the commentary, other lines that we felt might resonate with one of the lead quote lines or just juxtaposed it nicely. Yeah. So all the big plays and all the plays and all the big poems are represented, aren't they? Everything's represented apart from Edward III, which you were quite firm about not including. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now, we didn't choose famous quotes like... Is um, this a dagger, which I see before me? Or... A uh, horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Now, these are, these are great lines, but not very relevant to everyday life. I mean, how many of you... <laughs> How many of you have actually seen a dagger in front of you regularly so that you need to use that line? How many people here have lost their horse yeah. and need a new one? Well, absolutely, yeah. Not, I, one day we're going to say that line to, in a literary festival and somebody's going to say, I just lost my horse. And I needed a line from Shakespeare and it wasn't in your book. <laughs> <laughs> but look, here's a great example of the sort of uh, lines that we did include and, and how we dealt with it. Yeah, so imagine you're going somewhere and you want to catch a train. Well, what sort of person are you? This is the quote for January the 2nd. Better three hours too soon or a minute too late. Now, everyone will relate to a line of Shakespeare differently. There are those... E.g. my father. ..who arrive at a station to catch a train uh, that they're able... So early, I'm able to take the previous train, actually. <laughs> yeah. And then there are those... E.g. Ben. ..who arrive at the last minute. And almost miss their train. But always catch it. Always? <laughs> yeah, always. Oh, I don't know. Well, anyway, that quote, better three hours too soon than a minute too late, is from the Comedy of Errors. No, uh, it isn't. It's from the Merry Wives of Windsor. Why did I say the Comedy of Errors? I've got an answer, Dad, but I'm... Well, but never mind, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the speaker of this line is evidently of my father's mind. Uh, listen, I think most people are like me. Better three hours too soon than a minute too late. Now, Absolutely. I think most people are like me. Better a minute too early than three hours too soon. <laughs> yeah, well, look, let's have a vote. All right, oh, OK, all right. So you're going to catch a train. Let's have a show of hands. How many people here get to the station an hour before? And how many people are right up to the minute? I think I win. You do, don't you? Yeah, and, all right. And, and there are a fair number of people who don't do anything. <laughs> don't, 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 <laughs> don't travel by train we at all. We don't take train at all. <laughs> yeah, what about the online people? I mean, uh, well, can, we can't work that out. We'll find we? out later. If we you're, if you're online and got a strong opinion about this, put it in the <laughs> questions and we'll, we'll speak to it. OK, so, right, where are we now? Yes, let's read an entry to give you the kind of flavour of, uh, of the way we've done this. All right, well, um, uh, last week we recorded the audiobook for the book. That'll be coming out in a month's uh, time. So why don't we do it in the style of the audiobook? Oh, yeah. Well, in that case, we'll need a, a special guest. Ah, well, yes, indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, guys, gals and non-binary pals, please welcome on stage my mother, his wife, and the maker of all things good, Hilary Crystal. <laughs> Now, you'll notice that um, my dog rose at the applause. I, um, <laughs> she's been coming to performances ever since she was a wee puppy, and she knows that, uh, that when the applause happens that she can come back to me, so now she runs towards applause. Yeah. <laughs> she, she thinks the show is over now. <laughs> she thinks the show's for her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, we have our female voice now. Which day shall we choose, Hilary? Why not today's date? Well, well what is today's date? The 18th. Of July. Oh, yeah. OK, fine. Thank you. Right. So, well, OK, um, let's, let's find it in here. Yeah. Uh, oh, lovely one. Oh. OK, so this is how we record it. Uh, Dad and I uh, share the commentary in the audiobook, and you get to hear the lead quote of the day uh, spoken twice. You get to hear it at the beginning of the, uh, of, the, of the day's recording, and then Dad does it at the end in original pronunciation as well. The accent that Shakespeare and his actors would have, or a reconstruction of the accent that Shakespeare and his actors spoke in 400 years ago. July the 18th. 
So doth the greater glory dim the less. A substitute shines brightly as a king, until a king be by, and then his state empties itself, as doth an inland brook into the main of waters. Now, a substitute here has the sense of deputy or subordinate. We see something that attracts us, a thing that we can only describe as beautiful, it shines out at us, and then something even more beautiful comes right next to it. And suddenly, the the bright one that we thought was so wonderful, the first object of our amazement, seems slightly dull by comparison. Just like Mum standing next to you, I suppose, no? uh, Yeah. <laughs> ben, that is not in the script. No. <laughs> yeah. Everyday Shakespeare, Dad, you know, you get the interpretation from the moment. Anyway. Well, absolutely. And yeah. yet, great worth was considered to be found in the everyday among common folk. Henry VIII offers... A beggar's book outworths a noble's blood. Well, this is spoken by the Duke of Buckingham, and he thinks that a beggar's possessions, being few, have more value to them than rich ancestry, at least to the beggar. That merit and personal achievement are, are more valuable than what comes naturally, and thereby that learning from books is worth more than noble heritage. Our books were held in great appreciation in the plays 80% of people in London at that time were illiterate, couldn't read or write. And books were thought to hold magic, especially from the point of view of those who could not pass them. Today's lead quote is from The Merchant of Venice. The Lady Portia is on her way home in the dark and sees a candle shining from her house. She's impressed by how far its beams travel. Her maid, Nerissa, adds that they weren't able to see the candlelight when the moon was out, and this makes Portia reflect on the nature of greatness. So doth the greater a glory dim the less. A substitute shines brightly as a king until a king be by, and then his state empties itself as doth an inland brook into the main of waters. Mm. Nice. So that's a typical example of how we've written the book and how the audiobook will sound when it comes out next month. Thank you, Mum. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, not, actually, not, not yet, Edie, not no, yet. No, go down, go down. <laughs> and actually, I've just remembered, um, uh, and Sarah will, and the publishers will probably thank me for saying this, I believe in the book there's a discount for the audiobook as well. Oh, right, yeah. yes. With the added bonus of you doing OP. Oh, Unless okay. you could rock up to everybody that's bought a copy of the book and do the OP for them individually. Well, I could try, I suppose. <laughs> no, I'm getting a bit past that sort of thing. It's nice to hear the OP at the end. Though. Well, it is. I'll talk more about original pronunciation in a, in a little while. So, but for the book, there's a different page for every day of the year, a different quotation for every page. And... Sometimes more than one. I mean, remember that there's a thousand quotes in here, so several pages have got two or three. I mean, as you heard just now, um, many of the pages have a commentary, either to uh, explain what particular words mean or to relate other kinds of ideas to the lead quote or, or just to reflect on the everydayness of the quote that we've actually chosen. Now, of course, these commentaries are our interpretations, that often from a linguistic point of view, mine from an actorly or from a, 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 an, an everydayish point of view. And having removed the quotes from their original context, sometimes we draw on their original meanings, like what it would have meant in the play in that moment to that character. But often, having isolated the quote, it inspired a particular interpretation. Like, for instance, the line, better three hours too soon than a minute too late, and we applied it to catching a train. But there are as many ways to interpret that line as there are people watching and listening to this talk, which is a part of the point of Shakespeare. There's so much room for you to decide what it means to you. Well, how about this one? Make not your thoughts your prisons. Mm. What does that mean to you? Yeah. I mean, in the book, in several cases like that one, we felt... There's nothing else we can say. We'll just let the quote stand alone on the page with little that we can add. How about this one? We use this one from The Merchant of Venice when uh, Portia refuses payment for saving Antonio's life. He is well paid, 
that is well satisfied. Mm. Again, you know, can't add anything to that one, really. Good one to remember. Next time you do someone a favour and they want to pay you something and you don't want to take it, uh, he is well paid. Or she, of course, is well paid that is well satisfied. And most of the quotes inspire us to bring in similar lines from elsewhere in Shakespeare because they, they carry a kindred idea or a resonance or, or offered a fun juxtaposition. I mean, you heard that when we did the, um, the full page for the uh, audio book. We started off with The Merchant of Venice and then in the middle, did you notice, we had a little bit of quote from Henry VIII about the beggar. Now, a few of the quotes have been selected to chime with particular days uh, or dates. There's a love one on February the 14th, for example, Valentine's Day. English Valentine's Day, not on the Welsh Valentine's Day. They're not on no, the that's a bit later. No, it's earlier, yeah. 25th of January. Well, yeah, but Twin so, Wednesday. Well, a bit earlier then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, help me. <laughs> uh, but for those of you that are interested in, in pursuing the quote further, if you want to know like, more about where the quote came from, then it's hard to show, actually. But uh, at the bottom of every page... Uh, is a, a stamp, what we've called a play stamp, the, the name of the source, the play or the poem is, is stamped on every page and in fact every month there is a, a collection of these play stamps. They've been beautifully designed by Antonia Weir um, and uh, they've become a real nice uh, feature of it um, so, that, so that essentially every page lives by itself but then if a particular quote does resonate with you and and it really strikes a chord, then, and you want to go and find out where it came from, then you can be like, oh, yeah, all right, I'll give King John a read. Whereas before, you might never have even heard of the play King John or want to yeah. go and see it or, or, or read from it. Yeah, and there's an index at the back of the book, see, which gives you the, the, the play, the act, the scene, the line number, and so on, so that you can look it up and uh, see where the quote comes from and put the if you want to look it up on a site like our shakespeareswords.com, see exactly where it fits into the rest of the scene. And there's also an index of themes, which I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed making, which would be very useful if you need a Shakespeare quotation on a particular topic. Very good indexes they are too, though. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Yes. President of the Indexing Society? I was once, yes, when Such I was young. Such a geek. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So imagine, here's an example of what I mean. Ben. Yes, Father. You've been invited to a wedding reception. Not the wedding itself, just the reception. Just the reception. Okay, fine. Yes, that's right. And somebody has foolishly asked you to say a few words. Okay. Okay. Now, you're thinking about what to say, and you're wanting to say something really, really innovative and creative, not the usual platitudes that you, you can do on that occasion. <laughs> Shakespeare can help you. So, yes, uh, choose, choose your topic. <coughs> I suppose I'd, I'd probably choose something to do with love. Yeah, okay. Now, if you look love up in the back of the book, in, in, the, the, index. in the thematic index, yes. you'll have plenty of choices, over 20 uh, quotations on love to ch choose from. Um, here, here's one, February the 9th. I've told you that one. You, yes. You, you do that one. All right. Uh, <coughs> this is from Love's Labour's Lost. A lover's eyes will gaze an eagle blind. A lover's ear will hear the lowest sound. Mm. That reminds me, you know, you're at a party or something and your partner or your love is on the other side of the room and you hear them laugh or say something and your hearing is taken immediately yeah. to them. I bet you could make a nice speech out of that one. Well, I just started, didn't well, I? Well, you did, absolutely. You're right, you're sure. right. <laughs> you, damn it, you proved me right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just for formal occasions, of course. You know, we chose the quotes partly because they felt like tangible and pick upable enough and, and that no quote is too long or unmanageable to reflect on or to chew on, ideally to say it, to try saying out loud. Or to offer to a friend or to remember, to memorise or dare to drop it into everyday conversation. Yeah. You, you keep wondering how uh, people are going to end up using this Yeah, I, I don't know what's the best way of using this book, actually. I mean, you could sort of say, all right, every day at breakfast time, I'm going to look up today's quote in everyday Shakespeare, otherwise the day will be rotten. I mean, you could do it that way. Or if you're a teacher, maybe at the beginning of a class, you might drop one in to give the class something fresh to think about from the routine, maybe. I mean, uh, maybe uh, just sit on a comfy couch and read it in a few sittings. Or, or just flip back and forth, you know, until you come across a, a quote that 
strikes a chord with you? That was one of the inspirations for the book, actually. Both um, the Shakespeare's sonnets, which would be deadly if you tried to read them from 1 through to 154, you wouldn't get to sonnet, the best, well, one of the best ones, you wouldn't get to 18 if you tried to read them sequentially. Um, but rather to flip around and find one that really grabs you. And then the other inspiration was the Tao Te Ching as well, you know, flipping around until you find a, a few words that really strike a chord in you. Mm. Um, well, talking of strike chord, why don't we do um, uh, some top fives, Dad? Top five what? Well, um, let's start with, you said there were 20 quotes of love. Why don't we do the top five plays or poems that we took most quotes from? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, because I did a bit of research on that. Of course you did. Yeah. And, so, and, and, and I did a totting up. Of course and, you did. Yeah. And I always carry this with me because you never you know. You never know when somebody's going to ask you just which is the most important. That happened a lot to you, Dad. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So if I open this up, I can tell you exactly how many quotes there are. Now, which do you think is the most quoted play in the book? Which do you think? Romeo. No, no not quite. Who? Hamlet. Who said Hamlet? Hamlet. Yeah. Bang on. Hamlet. First Absolutely. one was Hamlet. What about the next one? Yeah, that's a bit trickier, I think. Yeah. Midsummer Night's Dream? Macbeth? No. No, next, next one is... Surprising one, it's Twelfth Night. It's Twelfth Night, yeah. And of course, the, we were picking these, but still, we were trying to pick them as objectively as possible. Hamlet is a very, very quotable play. Yeah. One uh, after that. Yeah, and then the next one as is... As You Like It. As You Like It, yes. Which is a very, very wordy play. So well, play, playfully wordy indeed. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely yeah. But then comes Romeo and Juliet, whoever said Romeo and Juliet, and, and Romeo and Juliet had one more than yeah. Macbeth. Yeah. And then King Lear comes next, and then King Lear, then Henry IV, part two, then... Henry IV, part two. Henry IV. Henry IV, part two. Like, if someone can name me a line from Henry IV, part two, right now... I couldn't even name a character from Henry IV, part two. <laughs> ben. Yeah. Henry. Oh, for... Yeah. The four. Yes, okay, thank you. The four. Not, not the son. Yeah, dad. Yes, exactly. Oh. Okay. All right, good. Yep. So the top five were Hamlet, Twelfth Night, As You Like It, Romeo and Juliet, and Macbeth. Which explains, in a way, I suppose, why those are the, uh, often the plays that are most studied. They're, uh, they're some of the most performed and produced plays as well. Uh, I suppose because they are filled with these drops of wisdom, these one-liners that really seem to, to, to grab hold of people's attention. Well, um, why don't we do a line from each of the plays? OK. Um, uh, Hamlet, start with. For this relief, much thanks. Yeah. A quote from, if you're busy or in a stressful or difficult situation, or doing something you really don't want to be doing, and then wonderfully, someone comes along and offers you help. Mm. For this relief, much thanks. Next, uh, Twelfth Night, a line for anyone who might be carousing into the small hours, into the late or early hours. Not to be bed after midnight is to be up betimes. <laughs> betimes means early. Yes. And the third one was, as you like it, uh, the one I've chosen here is, live a little, comfort a little, cheer thyself a little. Mm. Excellent line to say when you're trying to cheer somebody up. Um, then Romeo. Oh, I'd go for, uh, um, no, it's not Romeo, Romeo or anything like that. Tis an ill cook that cannot lick his own fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Now, ill means uh, poor or bad, right? But the character who said it, the maxim, is the ultimate test for fine food, applicable to chefs amateur as well as professional, right? Tis an ill cook that cannot lick his own fingers. Yeah. And one more then from our top five from Macbeth. I know this is a joyful trouble to you, but yet tis one. Mm. Now you've just asked someone to help you out, you, or to, to help you move, or, or to dry whilst you're washing the dishes, or to keep you company whilst you perform a tedious errand. It's a perfect opportunity for that line. I hear this 
from Dad an awful lot. I know it's a happy pain, but still a pain. I know this is a joyful trouble to you, but yet tis one. The number of times I've said that, I To me. And come on, look, they're, they're, I'm sure they're dying to know. I am dying to know. Give us a line from Henry IV, part two, part one, whichever no, one it was. part two, yeah. OK, this one. Something you can say if you step into a room, perceive that the mood is low, and think a jocular remark will help lighten the situation. How now? Rain within doors and none abroad? <laughs> it's a good one, isn't it? Really good one. This is the sort of thing that started this book off, these great lines in the plays or poems, but ones that are rarely heard or said or pulled out to, to, to be distinguished from the biggest and most famous lines. All right, so the ones that we just heard were all actually spoken by male speakers. So what about a top five of uh, female lines? Oh, no problem. I mean, we've, you'll find an excellent selection, a goodly selection oh, well in January alone. But female lines, we need our female voice back for the quotation. So Hilary, again, please. Come on, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's not over yet, Edie, yeah. <laughs> uh, right, so this is Queen Catherine in Henry VIII, reflecting on what people have been saying about Cardinal Wolsey. Men's evil manners live in brass. Their virtues we write in water. <laughs> the bad things we hear about people are remembered long after the good things about them are forgotten. And uh, men's evil manners live in brass, the line begins. But the line actually does apply to everybody, doesn't it? Doesn't yes, it? man or men in Shakespeare had a much more general sense of human being, as you know. Uh, what about this one? The Countess in All's Well That Ends Well, saying goodbye to her son, Bertram. Love all, trust a few, do wrong to none. Fine words to offer someone about to travel who you won't see again for a long while. And then there's Lucrece in the poem The Rape of Lucrece, looking at a picture of a tragic scene and comparing it to her own terrible situation. It easeth some, though none it ever cured, to think their dollar others have endured. You know, that was one of the first quotes. I, re I read that quote for the first time in university. It was one of the first Shakespeare quotes from, from you know, the Rape of Lucrece, a long narrative poem. But it was one of the first quotes from Shakespeare that really sort of struck a bell in me. And I wrote it out and put it on a little piece of paper and on a, a pen board. And it's, it was up there for, for 15 years or so. It easeth some, though none had ever cured, to think one's dollar, one's pain, others have endured. Mm. It's a lovely line. And it like, of course, it basically means misery loves company. <laughs> and the quote had a special force during the time when Shakespeare wrote it, because it was during a time of widespread disease. Um, when the plague was rife in Shakespeare's England. And then Twelfth Night. So we've got Olivia now trying to reassure Viola, disguised as Cesario. Be that thou knowest thou art, and then thou art as great as that thou fearest. Which is a way of saying, be yourself, I suppose, as fully as you possibly can, and then you'll be bigger than anything you fear. There's a lot of very good advice in Shakespeare as well. Mm. And lastly, Isabella in Measure for Measure, uh, trying to convince the Duke of what has happened to her. Make not impossible that which but seems unlike. <clears throat> unlike means um, unlikely or difficult to believe. You could say those lines are a warning against groundless self-doubt. Make not impossible that which but seems unlike. Mm. Nice one. So, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you again. Wonderful. <laughs> Stay. So, if there's one thing we discovered, it's that there's a line in Shakespeare for almost every occasion. Now, in the book, rather than presenting just a jumble of um, emotions and ideas and reflections scattered across the year, we, we gently curated the passing of the year, nudging each month towards a loose collection of themes and inviting a series of thoughts to flow together over the course of a week as well. Yeah. And January sees a grouping of well, what we thought were the best quotes that we could find. Well, you've just heard some of them. You've just heard five of them, so we won't do any more there. February is a swing through love and laughter. Mm. So here's an example from Henry VI, part one. Again, a play that not 
many people know much about. The Duke of Suffolk, at the end of the play, sees Margaret, the daughter of a French nobleman, for the first time. She's going to become Queen Margaret later for Henry, but he falls in love at first sight. So if you lack words to describe the sight of someone or something you love, well, this quote can provide it. Listen. As plays the sun upon the glassy streams, twinkling another counterfeited beam, so seems this gorgeous beauty to mine eyes. <sighs> the image is one of a beam of sunshine being reflected in water a second time. Counterfeited means make a duplicate of, that sort of sense. It's better than, oh, she's all right, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit. <laughs> uh, in the month of March, we take a deep dive into grief. Grief makes one hour seem ten. Sorrow, hope, and then peace. Here's uh, a character called Le Few at the end of All's Well That Ends Well, that famous play that everybody loves. Uh, and Le Few, overcome by the situation he finds himself in, says, Mine eyes smell onions. I shall weep anon. My <laughs> eyes smell onions. It's what brilliant. Beautiful line if you find yourself welling up or overcome by your emotion or after seeing a friend come to tears too. Yeah. April brings a month of everydayness that can be found in Shakespeare. This is the month that collects the quotes which most frequently made us sort of nod mm. and say to each other, uh, you know, I felt this the other day, yeah. or, or that'd be fun to say, Ben, wouldn't yeah. it? Hey, really? <laughs> Here's Trinculo in The Tempest. Stefano asks him how he managed to escape the wrecked ship on the sea. And he says... I can swim like a duck. <laughs> Anyone ever asks you if you can swim, you never have to say yes ever again. You can say, I can swim like a duck. If they say, what do you mean? Just before you jump in the water, you can say, I'm quoting Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> May, the month of May, invites a touch of nature. You look outside and see that it's started to rain. What would you say, Ben? Oh, it's raining. Oh, come on. <laughs> Boring. Try, try this one from Richard II. Like an unseasonable stormy day which makes the silver rivers drown their shores as if the world were all dissolved to tears. All dissolved to tears. That's amazing. And you can use the weather to talk about people. Like these lines from Henry IV, part one. As full of spirit as the month of May and gorgeous as the sun at midsummer. Yes, you are. <laughs> it's a good line to describe anyone who's full of energy and enthusiasm. I suppose I should use it to you, really. Me? Yeah. You can do if you like. Yeah, you're sort of sometimes full of energy and enthusiasm. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> June offers a useful selection in case you find yourself needing to insult somebody or... or uh, argue with them. There's many a man who hath more hair than wit. <laughs> ah. Thank you, Ben. That's from the Comedy of Errors. Wit means intelligence. I fight back with Thersites from Troilus and Cressida, criticising Ajax. Thou hast no more brain than I have in mine elbows. Okay. About this from Timon of Athens, as much foolery as I have, so much wit thou lackest. I give you Horatio from Hamlet. These are but wild and whirling words. Well, they're Shakespeare's, they're not mine. <laughs> well, uh, let's be nice to each other. Here's a nice one from the sonnets. A decrepit father takes delight to see his active child do deeds of youth. <laughs> decrepit? I thought we were going to be nice. Well, well, actually, decrepit isn't what you might think it means. I mean, it's a very negative term these days, but in Shakespeare's time, it, it had a much more neutral meaning. It meant sort of powerless or old and weak, but not necessarily in a nasty kind of way. Um, powerless because of the young son, you see, that's taking over the world. Yeah, it's like the tennis, really, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm sort of Djokovic, well, sort of older than him, actually. <laughs> so let me tell you, my, on, age, tell me. my age is as a lusty winter, frosty but kindly. 
that's old Adam talking in As You Like It. Yes, I, I identify with that. Yes, you're very frosty. <laughs> I mean kindly. Mm. Mum says lusty. Hang on, wait, no. <laughs> July explores politics and tyranny. Topical. Another area Shakespeare was especially good at, talking about political leaders, unpopular decisions, mutual suspicion between politicians, and so on and so forth, and the dangers. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Well, that's another one from Henry IV, part two. Mm. Perfect for a country that changes its leader every few months. Which country are you thinking of, Dan? Can't imagine. <laughs> ah, what about this one from uh, the Lucrece poem again? Lots of lines from the Lucrece poem. Uh, about any unpopular decision maker. Why should the private pleasure of some one become the public plague of many more? How about this one from As You Like It? The fashion of these times where none will sweat but for promotion. Mm. I love all these. Mm. <laughs> we love this one from uh, Pericles. Uh, Tis time to fear when tyrants seem to kiss. Mm. <laughs> August leans into lines of, well, profound yet accessible wisdom. Um, like this one from King Lear. Nothing will come of nothing. Mm. That's a line to think about if you want a reason to get out of bed in the morning and forge your own life's path, or if you're uncertain whether to follow a particular course of action. Yeah, well, in fact, you love this one so much, Ben, that you, he actually tattooed it on his arm. I did, I did. It's, it's right here. Nothing will come of nothing. Uh, it's, uh, I, I uh, hated Shakespeare in school. <laughs> I, I truly did. Um, and I, I really grew to hate it studying King Lear, and then... Uh, oh gosh, about six or seven or eight years later, it was playing, uh, we made a production of King Lear in a castle in Austria. I think we made the whole thing in about 10 days. Um, and I played Edgar, which is a brilliant part, and I transformed my appreciation of the play. Mm. And you know, you sort of grow up thinking, oh, I don't like peas. And then you get older and your tastes change and you go, oh, actually, I, I love peas. And <laughs> I, and, and I'd always loved this line that nothing will come, from, come out of nothing and that you can change your opinion about things. And, and as, that, as I said, it's a, as a self-employed actor, a reason to get out of bed in the morning and not wait for the phone to ring, but to make things happen. So uh, it's written in um, uh, dad's writing and my grand's writing and my mom's writing as well, because I'm a romantic. Oh, yeah. That's Aww. what they said. Actually, that's not what they said. Um, <laughs> Mum said, but, but you can't ever take it off. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good line. Uh, do you, uh, which line would you get of Shakespeare, Doug? Tattooed on you. A tattoo on me? Or maybe the question should be where? <laughs> Listen, there, there are no lines in Shakespeare that can express my emotion at this moment. About tattoo, no, I can think of two. Oh, God, help us. Yeah. Pish. <laughs> And, and, where, and where would you get it tattooed? And, and tush. Okay, I know where you'll get that one tattooed. <laughs> uh, well, September brings a month of work, honesty, secrets and money. Here's a good one from The Winter's Tale. One good deed, lying tongueless, slaughters a thousand waiting upon that. Our praises are our wages. Oh. Our yeah. praises are our wages, a reminder that our good deeds need to be appreciated with words and not by silence, not dying tongueless. And someone may have a store of worthy initiatives in mind, but failing to acknowledge just one can be enough to make the good angel lose all inclination to do more. October takes us through life with quotes about birth, love, marriage, having children, and some grounded observations about death. My favourite is actually the opening one we have in October. We are born to do benefits. Oh, a lovely line. If you want to help someone, offer them something and they, they find it difficult to accept. We're born to do benefits to each other. And it reminds me, one of my favourites from October is also a testament to friendship. It's from the two noble kinsmen, but it's a testament to us all being together. The world has gotten so divisive over the last few years. 
here being thus together. We are an endless mine to one another. We are one another's wife, ever begetting new births of love. We are father, friends, acquaintance. We are, to one another, families. I am your heir and you are mine. This place is our inheritance. No hard oppressor dare take this from us. Here, with a little patience, we shall live long and loving. Hmm. It's a reason to read Two Noble Kinsmen, isn't it? It is indeed. November brings a celebration of friends and friendship, close friendship, as well as a few useful quotes to, for when friends have to leave each other. Uh, like this one, for instance, when Romeo has to leave Friar Lawrence. But that a joy, past joy, calls out on me, it were a grief so brief to part with thee. Perhaps the most beautiful way to say it, you'd like to take more time in the moment of leaving someone you love, but you have something joyful to go to that you're late for and you've got to hurry. In this case, this was Romeo's leaving for his first night with Juliet, so it's kind of understandable, I suppose. <laughs> and finally, December takes us home with lines of arrival, celebration and kindly spirits. We chose this one. Uh, English has no expression for bon appetit you know, before a meal, has it really? You offer, to offer somebody good wishes, uh, and the common sort of waiters, you know, enjoy. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't really very good, and by comparison with these lines, Macbeth. Now, good digestion weight on appetite, and health on both. It's one of the quotes, you don't want to think too much about the context of the situation that he says. No. <laughs> And we chose this one uh, for December the 25th from the Comedy of Errors. Small cheer and great welcome makes a merry feast. That's a line for anyone that feels they might need to apologise for having limited fare they can offer their guests. Welcome is the best dish on the table. So there we are. A thousand or so quotes grouped into themes that span the months, all of which will hopefully offer a moment of resonance or reflection. And Talking of resonance, um, there's something about the sound of the language I was going to say. Look, he's winding up the watch of his wit. By and by, it will strike. Yes, yes, I was going to tell you about the original pronunciation. That's right, that's what it was. I was going to tell you. You remember, when we did our whole day reading with uh, Hillary, we spoke the lead quote twice, once in modern English and once in original pronunciation, or OP for short, at the end. Well, that's one of my contributions, especially to the, to the uh, audio book. Um, it's something that's become very popular. It started with Shakespeare's Globe back in 2004 when they did a production of Romeo in original pronunciation. I was advising them on that. And then it became so popular, it spread around the world. I mean, people just loved it. Uh, they did another production the next year, Troilus and Cressida. And then uh, there were people in the audience from all over the place. Americans in particular loved it because, you know, R is pronounced after the vowel. And that, of course, takes Shakespeare more towards American English than to, you know, Laurence Olivier sort of English. And uh, OP has, has just really, really taken off. Um, give you a couple of examples now so that you can tune your ear in once again. Uh, what about this one, Ben, um, from right. the sonnet? Uh, <clears throat> when to the sessions of sweet silent thought I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail my dear time's waste. Well, there we are. It's a sonnet. It's got a rhyme. It always did, audio rhyme in those days. And what have we got? We've got past and waste. Come on, Shakespeare, you can do better than that. Or even past and waste. Yeah, well, I'll pa well, I'll add past. Mm. All right. <laughs> but the thing is, of course, pronunciation has shifted. So in OP, it would be, when to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of money, a thing I thought I sought. And with old woes, new wail, my dear times, wast, wast and past, you see. So that's my world. Um, what about yours, Ben? Uh, what's your contribution, do you think, to all this? 
<laughs> it's just sort of ate popcorn, really. And... <laughs> but well, when no, you, when I mean, you th things have changed so much. Like, when you always told me that when you did exams in Shakespeare, you had to learn huge chunks to, to pass them. You'd have to use huge chunks of Shakespeare. And I believe you can still quote, and I know Mum can too, some of the lines that you learned, what is it, 100, 200 years ago now, like when you were, <laughs> when you were, when you were in school. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, decrepit it's, comes to mind yeah, well, again, yeah. <laughs> Fair. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I suppose I've grown up I'm, with an idea that being able to quote Shakespeare is something both impressive, but also something that's quite far removed from me, something that I, I didn't feel particularly qualified for. Um, and, uh, and the generation after me didn't even have to read a whole Shakespeare play in order to pass their exams. There's something, one of the reasons that I wanted to write this book and to make the, choose the quotes that we chose, but also make them you know, short enough for people to uh, speak, you know, to dare to speak out loud or even remember them and, and drop them into daily conversation is that we're missing and have been missing for a long time um, the teaching of, of oracy, the te teaching of the ability to speak your heart, it, but use, your, use your words to speak how you feel. We tell our younglings, say how you feel, but we don't teach them how, and certainly not in mainstream education. I think that's something that's been uh, missing for a long time. Literature, <coughs> studying literature doesn't help. The theatre does, of course. The theatre and the arts are fantastic for that, but they're usually the first departments to be cut, which is a huge shame. The arts, theatre, Shakespeare, they're factories for empathy and compassion, which arguably is what the world needs now more than ever. Mm. Um, I, you know, uh, we were talking about this. We did uh, the BBC Radio 3 show, The Verb, last week up in Hebden Bridge, and it was live, and they said, could you speak to, to why Shakespeare? Why is it relevant to you? And I, I wrote this, uh, it's sort of a, 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 a poetic bit of speech. I'll read it for you now. In theatre, I found my greatest teacher in Shakespeare's works. They taught me empathy, creativity, reasoning, compassion, conflict resolution, M maybe not so much. <laughs> but there is a place we can go. Can't sleep, no balm for hurt minds, waking up in the middle of the night in a fight, unhappy in your job, family, problems. Fancy your neighbour's husband, your best friend's intended, thinking of the end? I know now there's a body of work that captures much of what we need to thrive to help us avoid the first fist fight on Mars. <laughs> there's a place you can go, a sandbox to explore in, a fireproof place to test drive the thoughts and the feels. And I have heard it said, Unbidden guests are often welcomest when they are gone. <laughs> Society is no comfort to one not sociable. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. Grief makes one hour ten. And that deep torture may be called a hell when more is felt than one hath power to tell. Make not your thoughts your prisons. Give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. For gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks at it and sets it light. Since I left you, mine eye is in my mind. Ah! Thought kills me, I am not thought, to leap large distances when thou art gone. The miserable have no other medicine, but only hope. Yeah, I felt like this. Theatre gifts the education of an emotional life, the that which was missing from my school's curriculum. The theatre is an empathy drum, and Shakespeare bangs, dragging and drawing us to everything we are, the good and the bad, the kind and the sad, the loved and the lost, the worth and the cost of living and loving, winning 
and losing. Shakespeare offers us words to speak truth to power and questions to ask. I do love my country's good with a respect more tender, more holy and profound than mine own life. Shakespeare's theatre is a mirror. She reflects onto us images of humanity and they make us reflect in the Elizabethan. We reconsider, we check our beliefs. The web of our life is of a mingled yarn, good and ill together. Our remedies oft in ourselves do lie, which we ascribe to heaven wisely and slow. They stumble that run fast. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> well, well, that sums it up, really. Shall we go, then? You mean, shall we shog? Ah, shall we shog? Yeah, I mean, shog, really mysterious word, because nobody knows where it came from, really. It, um... It means sort of be gone in some ways. It's, it's from Henry IV, part one, this time. <laughs> yeah. It's one of Nim's favourite expressions, um, and he's the only character who uses it. It means, no, no, we can't go yet, Ben. There's, there's one more thing in our hour which we've got to put in. Is there more toil? No. That's from Park in Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes. Remember the line from Richard II, a while to work and after... Holiday. All right, okay. Mm. Before we go, we need to talk about sleep. It's mentioned, sleep is mentioned, you know, in every play. And vividly described in Macbeth, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labours, bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. Oh, I love sore labours. Tremendous. Yeah. Chief nourisher in life's feast. It's a great one, isn't it? I like this one from uh, Cymbeline as well. He that sleeps feels not the toothache. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So instead of saying just, you know, to somebody, sleep well, you know, oh, boring. Try this one from Julius Caesar. Enjoy the honey heavy dew of slumber. <laughs> yes. Mm. He's Jewels of lines we've shared with you today, they make a treasure chest of everyday language. So, as well as the, the, the special day language of love and longing. Well, the lines hold up a mirror, in a way, don't they? To, for us to peer into, to see if there's any part of ourselves familiar or strange is visible. Mm, hopefully as well, they provide the space for us to step back from taking part in life and instead to simply reflect for a while on, on how we live. You won't necessarily see yourself every day, um, but as Shakespeare holds this mirror up to us and the light refracts, you might get glimpses of you know, loves you've known. Jealousies you've felt. Re relationships you've entered into and situations you've encountered of that bring a sort of smile or a wince of, fam of familiarity. Oh, yeah. there we are. There we are. There, oh, look, yes, gosh, bang on Oof. the hour. Yeah, we're, we are time's subjects and time bids be gone. <laughs> That's from uh, <coughs> Henry the Fourth, part two. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we leave all our goodly friends? Bye. Uh, uh, God give you good in? No, that's a bit better, Ben, you know. A fair be all thy hopes, and prosperous be thy life in peace and war. Live and be prosperous, and farewell. It's not quite Spock's live long and prosper, but it's not far off, is it? Uh, 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 mm, yeah. Farewell, the gods with safety stand about thee. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Ah. It's a famous one. Juliet bidding Romeo good night. Shakespeare does it so well. I like Lepidus in Antony and Cleopatra. <coughs> Let all the number of the stars give light to thy fair way. Mm. And the one that we finished the book with, um, to thee no stars be dark. Yeah. And Theseus. Oh, Theseus in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Joy, 
gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. Or simply, uh, fare you all well and see you at the book signing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Edie. Thank you, Mother. Well done. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we do have some time for questions as well. Um, maybe if we could have a little bit of light. Uh, thank you very much. We can see everyone. There are some mics uh, rolling around the room. Uh, please throw your hands in the air like you just don't care. Um, my lady was uh, first here um, in the third row. And uh, I'll, uh, um, please, if you're online as well, pop your questions in. I think we've got a couple here already. Okay. My name is Helen. I work for UCL, University College London. Um, you say you had 5,000 quotes mm -hmm. and you're publishing 1,000. What was the process to move from 5 to yeah. 1,000? And what's happening to the 4,000? <laughs> <laughs> we, we took our shirts off, put on the boxing gloves and... Uh, it was quite contentious from time to time, I have to say. Um, we would have our favourite. I mean, actually, about, about two-thirds or more of them We'd chosen the same ones, you know, mm. so there was no question about that. Um, and then the, the, the real trick was to find which one was going to be the lead quote and which ones were going to be in the commentary. You know, some of those commentaries that we have have four or five supporting quotes inside. And that was where, um, well, we each had our different role to play. Ben would try and uh, choose quotes that would um, provide a kind of artistic arc to the entry. And I, as a linguist, would be worried more about whether the language needed too much explanation, you know, and things like that, and try to, try to find some of these quotes, uh, reinforcing quotes from elsewhere in the canon. The, the, so, the, first, the first process was literally going through every single play, and we had, like, post-it notes, and every time I saw a quote that I thought, oh, that might do, that, that, that resonates in some way, I put a sticker next to it. Mm. And then Dad had the joyful task of putting them, all of these into a database, and he'd put a yes or no or maybe next to them, and, and there were a good chunk that were really nice, but they really were so context dependent, they didn't quite live enough, well enough by themselves. Yeah, so. they've got to stand on their own two feet, these. Now, what's going to happen to the other 4,000 or We're, so? This is one of the online questions as well. Do the discarded 4,000 quotes mean that there are potentially four more volumes coming? <laughs> <laughs> one can only hope. Congratulations on this beautiful book for the heart, soul and mind for this lovely evening of Shakespeare sharing. Thank you, Gillian. That's really kind of you. Uh, yeah. Oh, nice. Well, that is, you know, a possibility. I mean, I've, it, it's taken us quite a while, you know, the best part of a couple of years to put this one together. A lot of the issues were to do with getting the design right. And I mean, you know, each page is only that big. So we've got, what, 300 odd words, 350 words to play with. And when the first time we did a draft, sometimes it was 500 words, you know, so we'd have to cut it back quite a lot. those 5,000 are very much the sort of the wheat from the wheat, not even the wheat from the chaff. And then the 1,000 are the wheat from the wheat, so it wouldn't even be like a follow-up book would be the B-sides. They'd still be pretty good A-sides, actually, yeah. but um, yeah, well... But uh, it all depends how this one sells, really. I mean, that's a, pub <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a publisher decision. We're just authors here, you know. Although we, we have just heard that they're going to turn this one into a calendar, which seems quite fun as well. So I know, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, there was another question. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a couple in the front row here. I can see any at the back. First, then, um, which of the quotes in the book would you say gains the most from being read in OP? Oh, anything with rhyme in it, definitely. I mean, there are two sides to OP. One is the things that you notice uh, because the the rhyme doesn't work. Uh, you know, when when um, Puck says in Midsummer Night's Dream, and he has it two lines about stars and wars. And they're supposed to rhyme, you know, it has to be stars and wars, you know, and then it works fine. Or oh, flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's alchemy, says um, the, 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 what's his name, Theseus? Uh, um, um, Oberon. Oberon, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the rhymes are the ones that jump out at you and where you think, oh, you know, it's needed. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is the overall phonesthetic novelty 
of hearing familiar lines read in a certain way. You see, when people hear OP for the first time, uh, most people say, you know, gosh, you know, we speak like that where I come from. Uh, people will recognize aspects of the aesthetic, the phonesthetic, in their own regional accent, regional dialect. That's why I said the American, Americans on the whole were, were very pleased with this because of the R's after the vowel all the time, you know, heart and car and car. Well, and, and they were pleased, as so many people are around the world, because suddenly there's an, a sound of Shakespeare being spoken that they naturally have, are already speaking, and they have an agency over speaking Shakespeare and a familiarity with it, rather than being told, oh, you don't have the right sound for Shakespeare because you're not speaking received pronunciation. Yeah. In sense. And so when you listen to a piece of, of OP, I mean, you know, O oh, for a muse of fire, O, oh. not, you know, O oh, for a muse of fire. No, 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 we're not, that, we're not in that <laughs> accent. Nothing wrong with that accent, but no, this is O. Oh. And anybody who's Welsh, for example, you know, they, that's, that's O, oh, you know. Oh, I, look, I've got a good one for this. Um, there's a, a line in um, Richard II, and he goes, um, I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world, and for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it, yet I'll hammer it out. And that yet I'll hammer it out is half a line of Shakespeare. Um, and you can go all the way around the world in half a line of Shakespeare in OP. So, oh, you can. Um, yes. Yet I'll hammer it out, mm. or yet I'll hammer it out in, in received pronunciation. It would be um, uh, yet or you'll hammer it out. So uh, yet, we don't say uh, yet. The Australians say yet. We say yet. Yet, uh, Australia. Oil, oil, oil is sort oil, of... Oil, oil. Uh, you'll hear that in, in Dublin and all over that so part of the world. Hammer. Hammer has kind of got that strong R sound that Dad. Any mentioned. southwestern people here, you know, Devon, Cornwall, Somerset. Or America. And America, of course. It. Yeah. It is just it. <laughs> <laughs> so you already speak some original pronunciation. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And then and out then becomes out, out, which is Canadian. Oat. Canadian, yeah. You know, anybody from Canada here, you know. So oat. half a line of Shakespeare, you go Australia, Ireland, West Country, America, Canada. Yeah. It's very, it's got a lot of, gives a lot of agency. We've got a question actually to do with OP here um, from Anne-Sophie. What was the most difficult part of recreating original pronunciation? Oh, Ben performing a sonnet in OP is one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. Oh. Thank you very much, Anne-Sophie. That's wonderful yeah. to hear. What was the most difficult part of recreating it, Dan? Uh, the f the you can say it was easy if you want. Yeah, yeah you know. Well, I you mean, did actually say that it is doing, recreating old accents is relatively straightforward linguistics. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of a hundred years of research here, you see. People have been reconstructing older pronunciations for 200 years. Going right back to Anglo-Saxon times, you can hear Old English in original pronunciation. There's a website for that. If you go to originalpronunciation.com, you'll hear some Old English spoken in that way. Chaucer is often very commonly done in, you know, when that April with his sweet showers, when that April with his sure sweater, the draught of March at Percy to the rota. You know, the, each, each of these uh, periods has had a lot of research into it. Shakespeare, perhaps more than most. So that wasn't the difficult part, except that no reconstruction is 100% perfect. You know, so I, I would always say you get to about 80 or 90%, and there's a 10% that... It drives no, you crazy, doesn't it? It does, it does. I can't sleep because there's no evidence for it. You know, there are no rhymes to help you. Um, there are no spellings to help you. Uh, people wrote books on pronunciation in Shakespeare's time, which is one of the big sources of evidence for OP, and they don't talk about this particular word, you see, or this particular name of a character. So they were the difficult bits. Mm. Um, uh, there's a question in the front here. Hello, my name is Susan, and I'm not English. <laughs> you are welcome here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm getting ready to volunteer with a group in Wales who represent a, a late 16th century farm community. And I joked that they'd have me sit in a corner and be quiet because of my accent. And they said that previously they had an English, uh, an American volunteering, so it wasn't a problem. And they said that that man was designated a mute. And I make bad mute. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> My question, I was curious with David's comment that the American accent lends itself because of the R's in that. And is there a chance that I can represent myself well in a community like that? coming from an, Eng an American accent. Oh, ab absolutely. And there are some theatres in America now uh, where 
they have so fallen in love with it. I mean, the Baltimore, you don't know whether you know the Baltimore Shakespeare Factory, um, for the last few years, they've done a play in OP every year. I mean, they've really taken it to heart. And uh, when OP, I was, I was amazed that it would be taken up so much, you, you know, but um, I was a bit worried to, to begin with. I, what I don't want was people to go to a Shakespeare play, walk out and say, wasn't the OP wonderful? Mm. <laughs> you know, no, then we failed. You know, because OP is a tool to get into the play and give it a, a sense of novelty, freshness, and a sense of ownership. I mean, mm. every American actor and director I've ever talked to when I was over there doing um, some work a few years ago, they all said, uh, we, many, many of us felt that we couldn't get ownership. Mm. Ownership was the word. Ownership and agency, it's a tool and also a bridge, I think, back to a place where um, it's n if you want to speak Shakespeare, you don't have to pick up received pronunciation, and nor do we think that the future should be um, everyone speaking Shakespeare in original pronunciation because of that familiarity, because of that 10%, actually, that space for people's own accents. I think uh, the, the world, the audiences are getting used to hearing Shakespeare spoken in the accent of whoever wants to speak it, and I think that original pronunciation has allowed that transition oh, more yeah. easily. That's a very important point. So yeah. that any, if you want to speak Shakespeare, the right sound for it is yours, your yeah. voice. There isn't one, oh, you've heard tonight David Crystal's OP, with my background, my mix of, well, my normal accent, what is it? You know, I was brought up in Wales, I spent 10 years in Liverpool, and that's what you're hearing as much as anything else. And so you're hearing OP through me. One of the first questions I got asked at Shakespeare's Globe in 2004 from all the actors that were there was, do we drop our accents and speak your OP? No, you keep your accent mm. and superimpose it on top of the OP. So in that Romeo and Juliet production, we had a Scottish Juliet, a, a Cockney nurse. Uh, we had a, uh, actually an RP um, background persons doing Romeo, uh, a Northern Ireland person doing uh, the servant and so on. Mm. And this variety, of course, will have reflected exactly what went on on Shakespeare's stage. Yeah, 100% because the actors came from all over the country. Mm. Um, is there another question in the house? Yeah, there's a couple here. Oh, and sorry, the gentleman here first. Well, well, thank you very much. This has been a very special evening. I think it'll, it'll be something that I'll recall very sweetly. You know, this idea of holding up a mirror, and it seems that Shakespeare can absorb almost any age in the sense that I know after the Second World War, Lear was the play that was most played. But recently, it's been Othello. I hear that Othello, in a sense, speaks to the types of tensions in our society. And I'm just wondering whether in the way you select things, because as an actor, you know, playing Othello or playing Shylock or playing Caliban mm. um, is a way in which we also begin to get outside our comfort zone. Yes. Uh, and is there a way in which you were able to sort of, you know, capture something of that, that where it's not just about a feel-good factor, but something that makes one uncomfortable, mm. especially issues of, um, yeah, issues of the other and Absolutely. how we see each other. Yeah, and thank you for speaking to that. We, we talk about this a bit in the introduction. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, especially in the last few years, there are parts of the world that are keen to put a moratorium on Shakespeare. Why are we studying in America the, or, or Australia um, the, the works of a, a dead white colonialist male? Um, and, uh, and there are lots of people that say that Shakespeare's works are uh, racist, that they're misogynist, that there's lines in it that are really, really offensive. And, um, and that's true. Now, was he, did he have those beliefs and those ideals or did, and those sort of, uh, in, did he think those things about different sorts of people? Well, first of all, we're never going to know what the man himself actually thought. And I think, you know, that's part of the reason for, for writing this book and the celebration of the first folio this year is that our attention needs to be on the works and not the person who ever created them and what they thought. And the brilliance of that mirror, I think, is that he holds it up, or, or, or that, that, that no, in fact, he doesn't hold it up. He, we are gifted these lines from this person. We get to hold them up, the we actors and performers and producers of Shakespeare and, and authors, to you all, and we don't, with this mirror, it doesn't just reflect back the things of our species that we want to see. 
And because we're not a nice species all the time, we're pretty good at doing really horrible things to each other too. And he's good at holding up the mirror to make us look at the beautiful parts of us, the love and the longing and, and all of that kind of thing. But he also makes us look at the things that we should not be proud of and we've got more work to do to avoid. We'll get to Mars, but we may not avoid that first fist fight unless we start gaining more empathy and compassion and, and doing some of the work and avoiding some of the choices that some of these characters make. So, uh, yeah, we, we didn't ignore them. I mean, there are a few pages in this book where, um, well, they're a bit dark, actually, mm. uh, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, sir. Well, I'm from India. Now, what is the Welcome. significance of the number three in Shakespeare's plays? You know, like horror, 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 three witches. So well, it's the magic number, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, actually in, and truly, it's a fantastic uh, rule of thumb for any comedian. The third is always the funniest, the three stooges and, and everything else. Um, and uh, and has got, the number has got a long history in, in all sorts of magic and folklore. That's why I imagine um, there are the, the three weird, weird sisters in Macbeth. A lot of the ideas that Shakespeare writes about and uses in his works were absolutely not his. He was a fantastic magpie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Feste in Twelfth Night, for instance, you know, one, two, a troll is to this Cressida, you remember that bit? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three. Absolutely. Yeah. Ba-dum. Yeah, <laughs> and it's always the third. Um, was there another question just further along? Uh, so one, I sh maybe shouldn't say this too loudly, uh, one of the best uh, Shakespeare plays I've seen was not in English, um, but in Polish, uh, which is my mother tongue. And... Um, it was translated into modern Polish, which was obviously easier for me to understand. Do you have any any opinions on when Shakespeare is translated or experience of this and, and how you view it? And as a little aside, do you have any favorite misquotes of Shakespeare or mis <laughs> mis misattributions of Shakespeare? Well, um, you can maybe do the misquotes, but uh, some of the best productions that I've seen in the last 20 years were, were not in English. Um, one of the most startling productions of Pericles I ever saw was in Japanese. The best production of Mary Wise of Windsor I ever saw was in Slovakian. Um, and there's a real joy to going to see Shakespeare in a language that isn't English, because I think partly going to see Shakespeare in English... Oh, do you remember the Midsummer Night's Dream that they did at Stratford and then in, in London? And with, around the world, uh, yeah. With, with half a dozen, from languages. India, you know, with half a dozen languages in there as well as, as, well as English. I think you're really released from how are they going to say that line if you know the play particularly. And is there any kind of idea of OP when it's translated? Is that in anyone's mind? Oh, you mean when, the, when they're translating oh, Shakespeare yeah. into other languages? Yeah. Well, I was just working in um, uh, Turkey, uh, in Istanbul, with a Shakespeare company out there. And um, this is a common thing, actually. The translators often have uh, a choice of whether to translate for sense or for poetry. And you're always going to lose one thing or another. A friend of mine was uh, translating uh, Midsummer Night's Dream into Japanese, which doesn't have rhyme. And of course, every time the lovers start talking about love or the forest in Midsummer Night's Dream, they switch to rhyme. So he, um, I think he decided to adapt uh, towards a sort of haiku rhythm to emulate the similar sort of effect that Shakespeare mm. has. So translators have a deal of a job with uh, translating mm. Shakespeare. And as for misquotations, well, one of the things you have to remember is that in Shakespeare's day, the concept didn't exist. I mean, today, if somebody misquotes, uh, people can say, look, it's in the book here, get the line right, dear boy, <laughs> you, you know. But no books in Shakespeare's day. Uh, the actors didn't have a sense of the whole play. You do a lot of this, Ben, don't you, when you do your quick raise plays and you give the actors just their cue scripts, in other words, just their lines. You use the analogy of an orchestra a lot, don't you? Um, that uh, all the musicians in an orchestra, they only have their own part. They don't have the overall score. And it's the same in Shakespeare's day. The actors had their individual parts. And so, and they only had two or three days to prepare. Uh, this is something Ben does a lot of. He can talk to you about that if you like. Um, but the thing is, so if an actor goes on stage and forgets a line or misquotes it, nobody would know. And nobody would care, particularly. They, it's only they when care the if you screw up the last line of their speech, because that's their cue to But that's speak. their cue for the next one. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's right. So we, we have a much more liberal uh, approach to the uh, whole, whole operation. And that's very important for the book, because when we offer you a quote, we don't mean use it exactly as is in the book. We mean adapt it to your own circumstances. 
you know, change he to she or whatever it or might they, be, or, you know, yeah. and things like that. Hey, we've got a, a question here from um, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, uh, it's my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, w go on, this is a good one for you, Dad. What is your least favourite play and why? Oh, I don't have a least favourite I knew favorite you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Nor do I have a favourite one. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I mean, the one, the one that's my favourite uh, is, is always the one I happen to be studying at the moment, in studying so at the moment. Yeah, and, and I don't, I'm afraid I can't, I can't give you any satisfaction. Merry Wise of Windsor, All's Well That Ends Well, terrible play. <laughs> um, and I, well, I don't have a lot of time for Love's Labour's Lost, but that being said, even these plays in the corners of the canon that you'd never read, because I mean, why would you read a play anyway, right? But you'd rarely go to see, because very few people produce it, um, and there's not a lot going on in it to take from it, but even those plays I've got a new appreciation for because of doing this book. I mean, that, that, surpri that surprise that we wrote into the script about Henry IV is real. There's some really great lines in that play. Yeah. Um, is there a, yeah, a couple more questions in the room up there? Oh, and there's one. Oh. oh, sorry. I just had a quick question. One, I just wanted to thank both of you because oh. I use your publications and the videos in the classroom all the time. Oh, great. And to see the kids kind of light up and see how the language can say what they are feeling. As you stated, we are missing so much oracy in education. So as a German English teacher, thank you both for Power that. Power to you. Um, and um, self-serving question. Hmm. Um, this book seems like it would be amazing in the classroom. Do you have any, or maybe it's a, public, a publication uh, question, but do you have any idea of, or any plans to maybe do some outreach with schools using this book as a foundation? I go into schools at least once or twice a month. Yeah. And um, we can certainly talk about that afterwards if you'd like. Be glad to. Yeah. Uh, right oh, there. And, the I, and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you used to. I used to. I used to do a lot. But, you know, a bit decrepit. For, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hear a lot about that. Uh, yes, please. Um, oh, I've got a question first, if that's oh, okay. Yeah, of course. Um, I think you said no quotes from Edward IV. Edward III. Edward III. Edward III. Edward III. King Edward III, yeah. How come? Yeah, in fact, that is a question that we had uh, online as well. Why is Edward III not included, yeah. father? Yeah, well, in Shakespeare's... You see, when we first started working together, Ben and I, we did this book called Shakespeare's Words, A Glossary and Language Companion. And uh, for that, we cast our net very wide and worried about the question of how many plays on the so-called periphery possibly by other authors, should we include? Because just to be clear, it's the 400th anniversary of the first folio. There are 36 plays in that book. 18 of them were not published during Shakespeare's <laughs> lifetime. They were decided by the actors that edited it that, they, that those 36 would be in. Yeah. In the last 20 years that we've been working together, the total number of Shakespeare's plays went officially from 36 to 37 to 38 Pericles, to 39 two noble and then back to 38. Yeah. Now, at the time, you know, we're all, we're all human, uh, and I'd just been to see a, a splendid production of King Edward III at Stratford, and was completely bowled over by the Shakespearean bits in that. Enough, I thought, that, and we had a good natter about it. Yeah, let, let, let's, let's put it in. But it's the only <laughs> one of that range of marginal plays that we dared to do. Now, over the years, we've... we've you know, followed the, the climate of opinion, really. And so many of these um, co-authored plays, or are they by Shakespeare at all, they've been sort of put into a separate kind of category by the scholars who, who do this kind of thing all the time. So we felt in the end that maybe that wasn't one of the ones that should be alongside the others, because you, you just don't know. Actually, actually, we may have put in some... I mean, Henry VIII, for instance. Or two noble kinsmen. Or two noble or kinsmen. May it was, maybe we put in a bit of Fletcher or Middleton, you know. We you say we're only human. There's uh, the last uh, complete works, I think, by, oh God, was it Oxford or someone? They, they put all the works through a computer, and the computer decided, based on the computational linguistics algorithms that they can do now, it wasn't before AI, uh, by looking at the words Shakespeare tends to use, was this line more likely or less likely by Shakespeare? And they came up with all sorts mm. of... 
different things, but yeah, um, yeah um, oh. I, there's one great scene in Edward III that's worth a read, but the rest, mm, not so much. Um, <laughs> Hello, um, my name's Amy and I run Shakespeare Workshops in Prison, oh, um, cool. Cool. where I bring an extract and then we have discussion. And a lot of the quotes you've mentioned I've used, but I wonder what kind of lesser known quotes might come to mind that you think might be particularly powerful in that context. Make not your thoughts your prison. Well, I have used that one. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Well, um, there's a, um, uh, Kurt Toflin, is it, I think, the American Shakespeare in Prisons work. Mm. Um, I'm going to San Quentin in August oh, to, to do more of it. So. Oh, wow. And um, I've just been out working in um, Sydney with Bell Shakespeare, who um, have a fantastic education programme all over the country. And for a few years, they went into um, juvenile detention mm. centres as well. There is, there, I mean, there is power and resonance in Shakespeare of, of, that will offer some great and deep reflection for us all, and it seems to be particularly nurturing and nourishing to folk in intense situations like that of all ages and situations. So yeah, it's fantastic work that you're doing. I mean, what we'd like to know is uh, what what you find when you do that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Tell us. Yeah. Um, um, to, I think it's just so powerful because of, you know, in prison, again, there are a lot of people that can't read and write and mm. may think Shakespeare's very inaccessible, but the themes just resonate so intensely that they pick it up, and it's amazing to watch. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, themes of guilt and revenge and thoughts of, oh, like, yeah. is salvation yeah. possible and blood on my hands, all of that just becomes so meaningful. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, thank you, know, you for that. Done in a very safe and careful and supported way, um, getting to discuss Macbeth with people that have actually you know, experienced what it is to take a life. It's, yeah. It can be profound. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Power to you. Um, have we got one last question in the room? A lady at the front, right here. Oh. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that students today don't have to uh, memorize long lines or long plays. A, a section, sections of plays as you did. Do you think the teachers think that Shakespeare is not as important as it used to be, or the students are just aren't interested, and so they say, "Well, let's just you know skip over that." And what's the trend today with younger people? Are they more interested in Shakespeare or less? I think. I mean, thank you for that. It's a really great question. Uh, I would first of all uh, stand up for the teachers who around the world are going through incredible terrible things first of all they're not being paid nearly enough for the jobs that they're doing just like the nurses and the, and the hospitals and the doctors too um as as um uh oh, the writer of the west wing said you know uh, schools should be cathedrals teachers should be on six-figure salaries so should the doctors and nurses um they the teachers in this country in australia and america are leaving their profession in droves partly because we're experiencing a mental health crisis as a result of the pandemic and the isolation that is causing the need for so much um, pastoral care of these young minds that are struggling to deal with having lost years of their young life and, and sociability and that kind of thing. So yeah, I think the teachers are interested and I don't think it's the, the next generation's faults that um, that they have had to go through this experience without sufficient support from, from us all, let alone we don't really understand fully the degrees to which our minds are being changed and our attention is being lost from these wonderful weapons of mass distraction <laughs> um, that are great tools but have become terrible uh, toys. And um, I think, uh, you know, again, with the way that the world's turning, everyone is thinking about needing to earn money. And I can testify to the fact that the arts and theatre are not great sources of um, finance. So uh, they are, as I said earlier, some of the first parts of education to, to go and to be cut. And we are not gifting the next generations with the power to speak. But uh, Ben. So it's, it's a very tricky time. But yeah. I do think that it, it, they are valuable works we need to give them more space. Yeah, and I've seen you do it. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen a class uh, say, Shakespeare's not for us, boring. Ben goes in and does a day's workshop. At the end of the day, they're all going, Shakespeare's fantastic, you know, can we do some more? It all depends how it's done. Shakespeare on the page, no. Shakespeare on the stage, yes. 
And if you can this turn it... This is why I tattooed that line on my arm. That was exactly. my own experience. Yeah, that's right. It can be done. You can change young minds that are against Shakespeare in a day, or in a few hours, really, mm. if it's done in the right way. And there's an awful lot of actors, and there are some in the room here now, who do this kind of thing through their education projects as part of their theatre work. And, and an so incredible on. number of teachers, some in this room right now, that have the passion and the heart to do this. We've just got to be able to give them the time, the space and the funds to do it better. Mm. Time Thank you for the question. Thank you all for coming today. A massive thank you uh, to Ben and David. Thank you to our online audience for joining us and to you guys here in the Piggott Theatre at the British Library. Um, ben and, uh, and David are going to be outside signing um, copies of their books. Do keep your eyes on the British Library What's On um, website because there's lots more um, exciting and wonderful events coming your way in the autumn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.